Melanie Swan is a research associate in quantum technologies at University College London. She has a PhD in philosophy in German idealism from Purdue University, an MBA in finance from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, and a BA from Georgetown University. Her research focuses on conceptual advance in physics, biology, literature, and smart network technologies. I'm very excited to be with you today because I always enjoy talking to a well-rounded, intelligent audience that I find at Mensa. Um, and the thing, the topic I thought would be most important to share with you today is uh, mathematics, quantum computing, and AI, how the formalization of the computational infrastructure is leading to scientific advance. And so this is, um, say approximately, uh, so I'll try to speak for uh, approximately 45 minutes, I guess, and then we'll have Q and A. Uh, so formalizing natural inspiration into reality is what I take our current moment uh, to be. Before Melanie, uh, before Melanie gets really started, um, I, if you haven't been to our meetings before and know how it works, put your questions in the chat and then Melanie can get them after she's through talking. Perfect. Yeah. Be it to me or Melanie. That's fine. Right. Uh, so, um, so I take our current moment to be uh, formalizing natural inspiration into reality. What I'm discussing today is part of my ongoing research program uh, of which the aim is AI science for humanity benefiting applications in genomic medicine, health, and well-being. The thesis I present to you today is that the computational infrastructure is becoming a vast interconnected fabric of formal methods per a major shift from 2D grids to 3D graphs in machine learning architectures. The implication is systems level digital science at unprecedented scale for discovery in a diverse range of scientific disciplines. The agenda is to first discuss AI and computational infrastructure, then math agents, then quantum computing, and then conclusion risks and AI alignment. First, opening with terminology, I'll be using uh, the term AI a lot, and I'm generically meaning the suite of technologies, including chatbots, LLMs, machine learning, deep neural nets, all of these kind of this kind of umbrella of machine uh, machine learning technologies. AI does have a more specific definition of approximating human intelligence with machines. This means data science methods, including machine learning, deep neural nets, uh, large language models, and graph neural nets, which I'll be discussing in more detail as we go through the talk. Quantum computing is performing computation with quantum objects, atoms, ions, and photons. That means manipulating these objects through logic gates with magnetic fields and lasers using quantum mechanical principles such as superposition and entanglement. Mathematics is the study of numbers, shapes, and space with axiomatic systems and symbolic logic. Computational infrastructure is the terrestrial and beyond global fiber optic ICT information communications technology network computation apparatus. That includes hardware and software, data centers, wireless networks, supercomputers, blockchains, quantum sensing, deep space nets, and Internet of Things. And then finally, a newish term uh, is a knowledge graph, which is a graph representation of information and its relationships. AI is emerging as the interface. Us humans are speaking natural language through typing or voice to LLMs, large language models, which have come on the scene very recently last year in, in large magnitude. And then the LLMs speak, if you will, formal languages, software code, math, physics, chemistry, astronomy, and biology to the more foundational levels of analysis in the computational infrastructure. 
We might also look at it the other way around that there are technology overlay layers of AI and blockchains, for example, extending across the computational infrastructure, uh, which is operating at various different scale domains, quantum, classical, and relativistic, each with their own matter-specific and time and space-specific properties. In the current moment, we are formalizing, we're interconnecting the knowledge graphs of different specific disciplines into an all-to-all -all connectivity of formal methods in the knowledge graph, an integrated computational fabric. Some examples of integrating the fabric of formal methods are math in math biology and genome math, having now a number theoretic explanation of maximum bound on of a maximum bound on neutral effect mutations, 25%, um, in a sum of digits fraction or Tagaki method, uh, essentially applying math to genome structure. Another example is a model to recover the statistical properties of cancer versus normal cells. So instead of having to directly uh, examine the cancer cells, obtaining their statistical properties, uh, working with them at a more abstract level to identify cancerous versus normal cells through their st statistical signature. Another area of integrating the fabric of formal methods is quantum information science and physics. So having, for example, an efficient quantum algorithm for dissipative nonlinear differential equations and uh, deriving a surface code for quantum error correction with transformer neural networks. Uh, finally, machine learning and physics are being interconnected by applying graph neural networks to high energy particle uh, reconstruction just as some very specific examples of how, what I mean with the argument that the computational fabric is becoming more integrated with its formal methods. Another conceptual advance of the moment is possibility space thinking. Thinking of the entire possibility space, not just a small, small segment of it, a small area, but thinking, thinking the entire possibility space. And what we find is that maybe our human derived efforts so far painstakingly obtained over centuries might just be one dot in the overall possibility space of the environment we're dealing with. So uh, whereas in language space with our LLMs, we have many of human natural languages now formalized in web accessible LLMs, uh, chatbot applications, and then uh, if we consider uh, software code programming space, maybe what um, this is uh, what Andre Kaparthi suggested in a software 2.0 model of computer-aided software code development, that perhaps everything humans have ever done is this small dot in the overall possibility space of programs, but software 2.0 would be computer-aided tools, which uh, now everybody, use, you know, many coders use GitHub Copilot, Tab9, Replete, or Codium to uh, as starter code, as code checking, as more efficient code uh, derived methods. And you can just speak English to the code copilots. You don't need to speak computer code to them. So this is the point that uh, why would we manually write a batch of code when a better plow is now available? Uh, similarly, we're moving in the mathematics space, both pure math and applied math, uh, looking into um, more, more complex computer algebra systems for theorem proving, for conjecture proving. <clears throat> Already computer algebra systems have been part of the digital math landscape for uh, at least 20 years or so. And what, has, what happens is that uh, maybe a human discovers a conjecture, but it really takes the um, computational algebra system to aid in the actual proving of the conjecture. So some of the more recent uh, four color theorem proving and other um, conjecture proving have required on the order of uh, 71 billion lemmas is one, uh, one quoted example. And just the, the size and complexity and routine basis of mathematics has, uh, is an early mover into a computational mathematics space. 
Um, also, a change in methods is uh, very interesting, these online data corpora methods that um, when I first started working on these math agent projects, we were OCR extracting equations from PDF papers. Uh, but now there's some, some ability to bypass all of that and infer the math data corpus from Stack Exchange or other online database repositories. The biology is another area where we are moving to entire possibility space thinking uh, with a host of new approaches. So we are now um, in able to move directly to drug design instead of discovery. We don't have to trial and error cycle through 10 to the 60th small molecules, which is uh, impossible anyway. So, uh, but we can proceed with a more of a, a designing the drug structure that we need. And so there's an example from uh, 2021, this uh, nature paper here for the drug Halicin, which was an approved diabetes drug that was repurposed as an antibiotic. Uh, through some of the new methods of um, predictive protein folding and molecule design versus discovery. Another big advance is a paradigm shift in medicine to perhaps treat the entire pathway, not a specific condition. And that that might involve 10 or 15 drugs tailored to the person, but looking at the pathway to identify genomic variation, epigenetic methylation, and gene regulatory network um, vari uh, variations, things that aren't working in a, a number of different levels in the genome, not simply the gene mutations associated with heart disease, for example, but a much more comprehensive, uh, large-scale big data approach to target the pathway. And then the other really interesting thing is that we had always is moving from uh, protein to DNA using the protein structures that pro AlphaFold has now inferred for the 224 million human proteins and beyond in many other organisms as well, uh, using the protein up method to impute, uh, to further calculate, well, the total possibility space for mutations in the genome. And so the, the next beat of AlphaFold has been alpha missense coming out this year and identifying the total possible missense mutations in the human genome. That's where one letter in the gene leads to one different amino acid in the 21 or so amino acid sequence series that uh, folds up to make a protein. And that the missense mutations are the biggest kind of uh, mutations in the human genome constituting about uh, almost two thirds of mutations are missense type mutations. And so instead of the traditional approach, which was start with DNA, calculate the transcription to RNA, then calculate the translation to proteins, completely upending it to go from the, what we know about the proteins to now what must be, um, what we can infer uh, about the genome. And then furthermore, that of these 71 million human missense mutations, about a third of them are pathogenic. Um, the others, others don't matter. So this is an, again, another um, way of helping us target our approaches to disease. So now we'll talk, a uh, deep dive a little more into the AI infrastructure. So a few slides on foundational technologies, LLMs, as I'm uh, probably many people in the audience are using, are large language models. Um, neural networks, their version of neural networks and neural networks or machine learning technologies in general are a function approximator. They try to learn the best function that describes a data set and uh, make predictions about new data. So a large language model is a machine learning model that can process natural language, uh, generate text, answer questions, and translate languages. Um, LLMs are pre-trained pre on very large data corpora with billions or trillions of parameters. And a parameter is a weight of a connection between values. If we consider the next word prediction is the main task. So when we think about the cat is on the blank, there will be a range of uh, words that, that come next in that sequence with a certain amount of probability of the 
or occurrence in the English language. Dog how, is often followed by bark. Water is often followed by leak. And as we start to search online and type into AI chatbots like Claude or ChatGPT or Bing, uh, often the next word, the next word prediction will be uh, suggested to us um, automatically online. So the, um, as I mentioned, the, the, the AI systems are typically fairly straightforward in, in uh, concept, if not in the details of implementation, but they try to approximate a function and uh, in LLMs going for just one thing, next word prediction. Some of the examples are GPT-3, GPT-4 from OpenAI, chat, that's also chat GPT, Code Interpreter is their mathematical engine that, uh, that's a little more, handles a little more technical content. Uh, Lambda and Palm are large language models from Google. Uh, Llama is from Meta. So these uh, LLMs are also, um, there are an, they are an example of transformer neural networks, which is a foundational technology that was proposed by Google in 2017 in a famous paper called Attention is All You Need from Baswani and colleagues. Now, a transformer neural network is a fully connected graph attention neural network model, <clears throat> which processes sequential data, such as text and audio, simultaneously. So there, I have a little bit of a picture uh, graph up at the top here. Um, input data are divided into tokens, which are same size chunks represented as vectors mapped into the latent space of all possible connections between values and processed through a series of transformations. That's why they're called transformer neural networks, uh, transformations or matrix multiplications to find correlations. Uh, semantic and syntactic in the data set. Attention is a technical, um, um, technical function of relaxing the nearest neighbor lookup in a vector space. The graph is fully connected. It's unclear what it might be important to pay attention to in a data set. And so the entire data set is processed simultaneously, initially paying attention to everything in an all to all connected graph, a fully connected graph, and then whittled into salient connections uh, in the processing. The data, um, what happens is the vectors are projected into high dimensional spaces um, and where the machine learning algorithms can search for relevant connections in the specific spaces. So there's a query space, namely what are all the potential queries that might be performed on this data set? Um, there is a keyword vector space. What are the keywords that might be used to describe these data? And then um, the value is the underlying value itself. So attention is basically a soft max or normalization kind of function performed on the key matrix, uh, the query matrix and the underlying value matrix. matrix. And so uh, to make this a little more clear in an example, uh, the data corpus might be Amazon reviews. And so queries might be all the kind of look of um, searches that a user might do on Amazon. And keywords might be the certain keywords that are tagged for the different uh, listings. Um, and then the value is the actual uh, underlying content. And so the key point of a transformer is number one, process the entire data set simultaneously. So that requires a very large data farm and a few weeks of high peak computation. It is like extremely high computational resources needed. And that's why it's Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft that are providing the computational infrastructure to process an entire batch of data at once. And then the um, this attention mechanism uh, for the nearest neighbor lookups in different kinds of vector spaces uh, to find the connections and the data. 
So Transformers, as I mentioned, came on the scene in 2017. They are the only game in town currently for all of the uh, all of the chat models that we see, all of the AI interfaces we see. It's expected that there could be some other future architecture. This won't be the final architecture, but right now it is a, a, a particularly successful architecture. Uh, so GPT is a generative pre-trained transformer. So all of the um, all of the AIs that we we may be using, like Claude.ai or HeyPy or Bing or ChatGPT, these are all uh, these are all GPT models, generative pre-trained transformer neural networks. Uh, generative meaning a system that can generate new content based on patterns and structures learned from the existing data set. And so another key moment was in, I guess, July 2022, a little over a year ago, when Midjourney and um, GPT and Image GPT won the Colorado State Fair uh, computer image competition. And that caused a lot of people to start to take notice of these GPT AIs, AI assistants. Um, so an interest, another interesting conceptual point is this pre-training. Um, AI systems are pre-trained on the latent space of all potential data connections. So an all-to-all -all connected graph. So that, that means all phrases that I could write or say are theoretically already connected and mapped in the latent space graph of human language. Every unique phrase that I think I might be saying in this talk already pre-exists in the English language uh, GPT model. Uh, so could we eventually, it's a philosophical question I won't be speculating on whether uh, LLMs might eventually be monkeys typing Shakespeare, uh, but it is sort of interesting to think that um, maybe everything, every thought we might have already had, every unique thought we could have is possibly already existing in the latent space of the fully connected graph. Um, so GPT research is a, a many hot topics here, and in particular, two top ones at the moment are retrieval nets. So a network being able to retrieve relevant information from an external knowledge base, and then also memory, um, storage and retrieval, time-stamped episodic memory. So um, having AI has more of a personal history dossier, which from which it could perhaps connect causal inference and um, internally learn rewards its own re rewards function. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the end about AI alignment. Um, so if we had some really big AI wake up moments, there was AlexNet in 2012, and then now G uh, Chad GPT a year ago in November, 2022. So what, what uh, the machine learning principles are always very straightforward, very easy. Uh, what makes the difference is very big data. And then running fairly simple or straightforward algorithms over these large data sets. And in the GPT case, analyzing the entire data set simultaneously. So somebody jokingly, you may have heard, was referring to this chat GPT, um, um, to, to GPTs in general as, oh, well, it's, it's a dump of the internet plus 10 lines of code. It's not uh, uh, that in conceptually, the key point is get very big data and process it all at once. Um, so what made a difference in 2012, Peter Norvig here uh, down the street here at Google, um, the key point was we humans did this amazing thing, which is create a database of labeled data on YouTube, namely cat videos, pictures of cats that were labeled with the word cat and supervised learning was in business. And that allowed those kinds of online big data corpora allowed the big uh, early AI moves and say being able to translate a news article from one language to another. Um, this, is, this is when Google Translate got going as well. Um, so some of these, these key moments in AI and then Last, uh, last year, ChatGPT was uh, the fastest, fastest technology to uh, rise to 1 million users, which it did apparently in five days. 
Um, so now extending, so it continues the foundational technology. Uh, there are GNNs. These are graph transformer neural nets. And this is really a boon to science. These are uh, neural networks designed to process graph structured data. So in the, um, it's really quite different moving from a 2D grid rep representation of data as in this photo to a 3D graph. Uh, much of the world we deal with and that is uh, in our bodies and proteins is 3D graphs. Molecules are in 3D structure. And so the trick is trying to figure out uh, how to represent 3D graph data in neural network architectures. And so that is what uh, this major transformation also over the last uh, five, uh, probably in the last five years has also been doing is focusing on the 3D representation of data. And this is required. And then this is on the way to the next step will be more than 3D manifolds. And a manifold, for example, is a, um, a space that has changing curvature over, over its range. So a knee, a human knee or head, for example, or a gravitational well. And so um, all of these domains um, require higher math, uh, require math from physics based on invariance and symmetry and certain kinds of group transformations. And so in the simplest version of grid, there is uh, an invariance. We wanna be able to transform the data but not lose the key properties. And then now in graphs, there, there are different, more sophisticated kinds of invariance that we are, uh, the calculation, the computational networks undertake to analyze the data. And then finally with manifolds will be into full, fully physics types of configurations regarding gauge symmetry. So um, symmetry is basically an object looking similar um, from different viewpoints. And there are different kinds of transformations uh, that can be undertaken on a data set to find salient patterns without changing the properties of their underlying data. And so in particular with the protein folding example with molecules, what is relevant is a concept called equivariance. And equivariance is generally meaning that, that certain kinds of translations uh, or, or transformations, namely translation, sliding the image uh, or rotating it a little bit on its axis, but not reflection, not a mirror image. Um, symmetry are the kinds of operations that can be uh, explored in the data set to try to fold the protein, for example, um, in the neural network models. So an example of graph neural networks that we might see every day is in the Google Maps estimated time of arrival. This um, is a, a graph operation and it has improved the negative system predictions by over 40% over time. So uh, point clouds is another way that our, world, our computational infrastructure is shifting to 3D we are uh, making 3D point clouds, uh, X, Y, Z axes of data capture from um, real life objects for precise online models. So there are a number of different molecule level types of operations such as drug design, proteins, and DNA. Quantum computing is about manipulating molecules through logic gates um, or, or atoms even and uh, atomically precise microscopy and manufacturing. Digital twins are very much in process. This would be uh, uh, David Galertner's mirror worlds that we are starting to have digital versions of our infrastructure, architecture, maps, surveying, roadway systems, um, land, uh, land masses, and traffic smart mapping in cities. 3D modeling and gaming and virtual reality, now having um, self, self video capture of our bodies by which we can make avatars and join the meta virtual reality space. And then of course, robotics and autonomous vehicles. So um, modeling point clouds in real time in self-driving networks has allowed us to, um, to progress in that domain. Uh, 
Um, so modeling molecules as graphs, the just in more a little bit more detail, the, ta the idea is to represent molecules as graphs. Molecules are are all, uh, in real life in a 3D kind of a format. And when we start to represent them in graph neural networks, then we the atoms are the nodes, the bonds are the edges, and the features are aspects such as the type of atom, the charge, and the type of bond. So the um, while us humans are in low dimensional Euclidean 3D space and 1D time, our computational infrastructure is not limited this way and operates in, in high dimensionality. In space, we have quickly progressed into beyond Euclidean space with hyperbolic um, and spherical space. So spherical space is a triangle, say, on the outside of a sphere. A hyperbolic space is um, a triangle under a saddle. And so these triangles will not sum to the traditional 180 degrees. But there are many different uh, diverse geometries, different kinds of space. And we are starting to find that these are much more efficient spaces to operate our computational infrastructure and neural networks in. In time, also, we are not bound by Euclidean time. We are in the graph neural networks. Time warping is a standard technique, which is basically a, a renormalizing or normalizing the time dimension, stretching or compressing temporal data sequences for pattern finding, and so that similarities can be found independent of local shifts and timing variations. In biology, there are numerous different temporal regimes, such as oscillation, periodicity, waves, and circadian rhythms. In physics, we are familiar with information scrambling, chaotic time, which would be a ballistic spread followed by a saturation. In quantum time, multiple dimensions by using offsetting lasers to effectively create a second time dimension, both in periodic time, the floquet time, as well as quasi-periodic time, and then just time simultaneity in geology, seeing a simultaneous view of multiple historical epochs. So our technologies are starting to be more portable with time and space. The um, contemporary, so the, the key argument I'm making is that the computational infrastructure is becoming more formal and essentially our our computational infrastructure is an implementation of math and physics. And you, we can just read that off of contemporary paper titles as to the complexity um, that's being implemented in graph neural networks in the computational infrastructure. So for example, graph neural networks as gradient flows, um, understanding convolution on graphs via uh, energies, Advective diffusion transformer for topological generalization in graph learning. Hyperbolic deep reinforcement learning is an example of modeling latent representations in hyperbolic space for greater efficiency. Neural warp is a time series similarity with warping networks that um, renormalize time. And sheaf neural networks with connection Laplacians is a version of graph uh, sheaf neural networks are graph neural networks operating on a cellular sheaf, which is a graph with vector spaces over nodes and edges and linear maps between the spaces. So the point is just the uh, incredible sophistication at which we are developing these uh, neural network technologies. Also moving from another more specifically about moving from 2D grids to 3D graphs in our representations in the in neural networks. Um, uh, just a little sort of more specifically, uh, we are always been, neural networks have always entailed linear algebra and matrix multiplication operations. And so that's still the same, but it's more complicated. So for example, there could be a spectral graph as a pre-processing for a spatial graph. There are various different deployments of eigenvalues, eigenvectors, eigenpooling, eigen broadcasting, eigen, eigen de decomposition. And eigen, um, eigen always tends to call for me a, um, a, a zero ground state and then allowable energy tiers or allowable valued tiers in a system. And so, which 
also calls the idea of a formalized space. Some things are allowed and other things are not. A circulant is a, a special kind of uh, circulating uh, matrix operation, basically. Laplacian matrices are routine in use, and this is a difference between an adjacency graph and a degree graph, uh, probabilistic graph models. And um, nothing, nothing's, the, the overall objective is still the same, which is to process data, find relationships and patterns in data, make new data, write a function for it. Um, that the objective is the same, but the ways that we're doing this is particularly complex and involving um, involving more sophisticated math than we might have thought. Then we are uh, needing visualization tools for over million, 1 million node uh, graphs to try to understand and assess the relationships in a virtual cell, for example, or an astronomical data return. Now, AlphaFold2 is a special kind of neural network. Let's check the chat. Somebody's seeing a gray box. Uh, let me know if you're not seeing things well. So I'm on the AlphaFold slide, um, where AlphaFold is a graph transformer neural network for predicting the 3D structure of proteins from underlying amino acid sequences. The, so it's basically just more sophisticated uh, graph neural network with some additional bells and whistles for the protein folding operation. Um, and, uh, not in, not uh, you know in not a non-trivial <laughs> bells and whistles. So the architecture of AlphaFold two is that it has two two modules. First of all, the alignment module, which goes out, it looks for similar protein sequences in the evolutionary databases. Uh, databases for other organisms and over time and finds similar features, uh, finds similar sequences and extracts the features. Then the second module, the main module, the is called the structure module, and that has uh, two, transformer, two transformer neural networks, which predict the distance and angles between each pair of amino acids and then an optimization algorithm, which event converts the predicted distances and angles to 3D structure in its folded conformation. So attention, which is the um, identifying what to pay attention to in a batch of data, is a special kind of attention in AlphaFold 2 network, which is called invariant point attention. And this is an attention mechanism which combines queries, keys, and values, the three parameters we saw earlier, with four by four trans transformation matrices to encode the rotations and translations of each amino acid. The network is able to perform simultaneous local and global analysis because what's global, you don't know what will be local once it gets folded. So you needed to really look at the whole thing initially and that um, that will be invariant to global transformations on the global, on the uh, compared to traditional GNNs. So I think, okay, so Judy is instructing somebody. All right, thank you. Um, so vector embedding. Um, AI speaks uh, zeros and ones. So it doesn't, whatever mode of data it receives, it converts to vectors uh, for high dimensional analysis. And that could, whatever the data input is. So the key, what's different for us as humans is that we think these, these modalities are so different. An image, a text, sound, equations, software code, chemical formulas, DNA sequences, proteins. But to a computer, they all get converted to some form of zeros and ones, preserving um, relations in the data, pumped into a vector database, projected into space, and analyzed for their interconnections. Um, so the famous um, algorithm driving the LLMs is called word to vec and this uh, algorithm came out and it's basically an algorithm for using a neural network to learn word associations from text corpora to do this next word prediction by, a pro by predicting the closeness of words. So for example, uh, uh, cat 
and meow and dog and bark will have a, have closeness in a vector representation and word to vector representation. Now this uh, word to vec has uh, uh, this how to predict assess nearest neighbor closeness of relational meaning in databases has proceeded to many other um, no, other vector formulations such as node to vec and edge to vec in the graph learning environment. And then also in biology. So there's a disease to vec, drug to vec, and gene to vec. So these are all algorithms that learn the vector representations of the underlying data and they use to pr predict other information in these databases. So in my research, what we've done is this math to vec idea with math agents. So math agent is a learning agent operating in the mathematical knowledge graph, either pure or applied, to analyze, solve, discover, prove, and steward mathematical ecologies. So math embedding is the underlying data is math uh, equations represented as a character string in a vector space for high dimensional AI systems analysis. A math ecology or a mathscape is a set of related mathematical equations, and an equation cluster is uh, similar equations grouped in the mathematical ecology embedding visualization. And so here are a couple of uh, representations of equation ecologies, one in OpenAI um, in its latex version, and vector embedding of latex equations all associated with one larger set of equations equations, and then in uh, the top view, latex, and then in SymPy, symbolic Python in the bottom. Um, and I have some more of that coming up. But the uh, math agent space is growing quite a bit. There are different kinds of math agents, neural network based, word based, and symbol based. So neural network based would be more for for pure math types of applications. And this uh, nature paper was featured from DeepMind in 2021 uh, on this topic, using neural network math agents to prove conjectures, accelerate calculations, generate, generate symbolic solutions, and detect the existence of structure in mathematical objects. So some mathematicians suggest that just as AI has beaten humans at chess and go, that maybe finding and theorem proving uh, could be next. Another flavor of math agents is word-based mathematical reasoning agents. So just like LLMs, uh, LLMs work well on text analysis. And so they analyze uh, any kind of English language or human language, natural language text, discussing equations in papers or in databases. And then symbol-based, I mentioned extracting uh, latex equations from uh, with OCR, uh, from paper PDFs and converting them to symbolic Python. But now maybe it's possible to infer the mathematical knowledge graph from Stack Exchange or other online fora. So here's just a picture of the math agent landscaping with a quantitative reasons, reasoning on high quality tokens. Uh, math or code has a, a well more well a, a well formedness to it than uh, than other than other content on the web, for example, and in fact, mathematical reasoning has been improving uh, regular reasoning, uh, reasoning more generally in LLM machines. Um, AI seems particularly good at uh, cutting its teeth on uh, more formal, um, more formal uh, tokens of information. And then another uh, alpha tensor is another in the alpha, in the DeepMind family of um, a tool with, for mathematical discovery with matrix, matrix multiplication algorithms. So here's the mathematical embedding. Um, at the top actually are, are embeddings, uh, not of math, but of different data sets. The uh, 2017 papers by journal, archive paper titles by the keyword and literature, um, an in interface for looking at literature papers. But here at the bottom, we have some in the um, 
And my research program, what we're looking at is physics math models, namely ADS CFT, which is anti decisor space conformal field theory, which is a renormalization math uh, for black holes, and also Chern Simons theory, which is a topological modeling mathematics. These are both examples of how to look at a multi scalar system in one view. And so I, we, we have done is made vector embeddings of the underlying equations. And here you see eight different representations of the same, of the 80 or so equations that appeared in one paper. And each different, the point is that different vector embedding algorithms or schema lead to different ways of viewing your data. And the important thing is not necessarily the X and Y axis values, but how the data clustering is happening. And so these clusters would be interpreted as um, the equations that are clustered together. Each data point is an equation. And as they cluster, that is similar kinds of equations clustering in similar areas. So all of the um, sort of the, uh, the space metrics, for example, will co-locate generally. So here, and just to mention that there's a cancer to VEC um, view at the top. Um, but here is a zoom in of the box on the previous graph of um, with the annotation of what these equations are. And so you can kind of see that the ds squared in the bottom panel, the ds squared is the space-time metric equations. And so this is um, confirming that they they're all clustering together. So this is some human validation of um, how did the, what is the vector embedding doing? And um, so we can look at the, the key point is to look at a whole set of math equations in a paper or bigger data sets uh, together in one view and try to work with that in analysis. Now, in this case of blending math different math systems of math equations together with data um, to see if there's overlay or how we might look at math and data as two sides of one system. There are two different representations of a system. Uh, so in the top left are various uh, different models that have been proposed for Alzheimer's math and what they look like in uh, an ecology here. And in the right top right panel is a particular is the Chern Simons physics math in blue, the, um, the Ben Wellos Cindy math for how transposon, transposable elements get turned on in Alzheimer's disease math, proposed math, and then the Alzheimer's disease SNPs or genetic variants as data in the green. And the idea is just to try to see. Um, see what, what these, what math as data corpus and what genetic SNPs as data corpus look like together, um, all purportedly to describe Alzheimer's on one graph. And then in the bottom is uh, more representation of mathematical ecologies and then specific uh, genomic view of in the bottom right, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and ALS disease SNPs all in one graph. And so what's helpful here is that we can see there's a lot of overlap, in fact, between these three diseases. And now we're also understanding Down syndrome as uh, possibly being related to, to this neurodegenerative ecology. And then finally, uh, this final data slide, applying this information to two, uh, two persons in the study, citizen one and citizen two, as to their own um, Alzheimer's SNPs that, um, and so that you can see in the bottom here, the variants of um, citizen one has more mutations in certain kinds of genes and citizen two and other certain other kinds of genes. And so the implication would be moving to personalized therapies that target these particular things for the individuals.
So then blockchains can't start to come in because we're doing data at such, uh, we're doing science at such a large scale online, the uh, web, lab web laboratories as opposed to wet laboratories that we are needing uh, decentralized methods for data production and sharing and operation. And so blockchain blockchains start to come back uh, in this environment, and particularly the Lab DAO, which is an open community governed platform with uh, access to tools and data and papers. Math blockchains might also be a tracking mechanism by which large ecologies of equations could be evaluated. So the problem is that now equations are represented digitally in the form of latex or symbolic Python, but they're not. E um, evaluated. We really haven't been solving mathematical equations, and including because most of them don't have number numeric answers, they just simplify to other equations. And so um, uh, humans, this is really not a good use of human time, but we do want math agents to be evaluating, checking for efficiency, finding relations between large sets of mathematical equations and their alignment with data. Uh, and this could be relevant for not only pure math uh, mathematicians, but for all kinds of uh, individuals. So now moving into quantum computing, uh, where we are is that the highlight is that quantum computing seems to be about two years out at least. Uh, before before really hitting its uh, speculative future technology still. IBM is out there uh, still uh, saying that they will be releasing their 1,000 qubit chip this year. So they have six weeks to do that in, the Condor. Um, and then we're hoping that quantum, um, that AI may help us discover additional quantum algorithms and write code. We know that uh, quantum computers are much more sensitive to noise than classical computers, and you can't easily correct them. So special quantum error correction methods are needed before we really move to general purpose quantum computing with a million qubit machine. And a million qubits would also be needed to break our current cryptography, our RSA uh, cryptography and US NIST is continuing to um, have competitions to produce quantum secure crypto algorithms uh, before wide scale quantum computing really becomes, um, it, it is really on the horizon. So here the IBM roadmap continues to suggest that they will be announcing Condor this year. And they have also more importantly in July announced a new um, error code scheme with a graph, a Tanner graph surface code. It's an, a version of LDPC from traditional error correction and communications networks where they are protecting uh, 12 logical qubits with 288 physical qubits, 24 physical qubits to protect one logical qubit. And that's a tr dramatically improved ratio compared to previous methods. So we'll see how that goes. Um, it's all about the chips, the QPUs, the quantum processing units. Um, in AI, we're using both the NVIDIA GPUs, as you probably noticed NVIDIA's stock price. Um, GPUs are flying off the shelf still for AI chip processing. Tensor processing units, similarly. And then next in the evolution of computing hard, uh, hardware chips is quantum processing units. Um, Google Sycamore chip, for example. And so the presumably quantum chips, QPUs can roll, roll out exactly through the worldwide semiconductor factory, a fab infrastructure. So it's just um, f uh, deriving the technology with the quantum error correction to make the chips um, that, the, that once we have the technology, it can be rolled out fairly quickly. There is a potential of AI quantum computing convergence with both Google and IBM, other vendors out there with a roadmap, and then AI perhaps helping analyze the quantum data, find the quantum algorithms, conducting the quantum machine learning um, on quantum platforms. So the two, two could be extremely uh, profitable technologies together. 
Uh, quantum has its own specific properties, namely these five of superposition, entanglement, interference, symmetry, and quantum tunneling. We've already been dealing with quantum properties in molecular and semiconductors and molecular computing uh, ever since the 60s when we have been dealing with photonics quite seriously. And so now it just extends into working with you know, molecules that are super in superposition or entanglement or uh, interference, uh, having a coherent wave function together and uh, working with their known properties and we're working with them. It's an engineering problem. It's not a philosophy problem as Einstein uh, initially misunderstood how, how this works uh, with the uh, information available to him at the time. Uh, so quantum computing, you can see the, the why we need it, how it can be immediately useful because we're not able to model even simulate even the simplest of molecules, caffeine with 24 atoms or penicillin with 41 atoms. And these are just one molecule. We don't have the computational capability to model these, uh, but we could fairly easily, it's thought, with quantum computational models. Tensor networks is another uh, quantum application. Tensor networks are a network architecture for expressing high order tensors as low order tensors by contracting their indices. And both the graph neural networks we talked about or you know, neural networks in general are, are tensor networks. They're using the Google TPU tensor processing unit chips and, um, and tensor networks are used to treat entanglement and quantum systems, the renormalization technique of coarse graining, uh, pooling, disentangling, capturing global local features in uh, multiscalar systems. And so the idea would be to model multiscalar systems that have different tiers of activity, such as the brain with a synapse and neuron network and brain levels of activity, different modalities of expression, and getting them uh, modeled in quantum systems. Quantum science areas are very much like the ones we see for uh, AI science areas, namely most areas of technically related science. There is a quantum computing ecosystem with many different startups and large company players out there. Um, there are public companies, IBM obviously, but it's not a pure play. Rigetti and D-Wave are public, but have not been doing well and face possible delisting. IonQ, on the other hand, just reported this week, they um, sold a, a big quantum, they're in Maryland, they sold a system to the Air Force and they look to be, um, they look to be good as a pure play, but uh, in a very, I mean, if quantum computing speculative and quantum computing <laughs> in the market is even more speculative, but just to mention, but, um, the status of that. So taking a quick look at how quantum circuits work, each, uh, this is a, a 10 qubit system. Each, first of all, each horizontal line represents a qubit. Initial, uh, qubits are initialized to the zero value, typically because that's known. Then the color blocks represent the different kinds of operations acting on the qubits. These are op quantum operators that act on the qubits and they're executed with uh, magnetic fields and lasers to guide the <clears throat> qubits into different states of entanglement and through different logic computations. And then at the end, um, and then when two qubits or lines are connected, they're entangled to perform a certain operation. Uh, the qubits are literally in, a, in one or zero uh, or one and zero superposition at all times during the computation until measurement at the end with the black uh, measurement half circle. And then the wave function collapse and they collapse into a zero or a one and are red just like any other digital system. Uh, so the key point is that um, atoms are manipulated through computation in the usual way and just with a few additional aspects due to the quantum uh, system. Uh, finally, it is uh, quantum is contentious in a number of ways. A number of um, processes which were thought to 
be using quantum properties have been revealed to be are dequantized. They're revealed not to, to be classically, have classically sufficient explanations, photosynthesis. Some people still think it's quantum related because excitons are involved. Other people think a classical uh, explanation is sufficient. Uh, there seem to be a couple of cases with magneto navigation in birds and tunneling in enzymes that are still thought to be uh, quantum processes in biology. But um, the the um, seems that we are we're we're getting better at our classical science, and so we don't have to abdicate to quantum explanations all the time. Finally, in concluding. I propose that knowledge graphs and computational infrastructure as a vast fabric of formal methods, uh, AI, LLMs, neural networks, machine learning, the, this is all an implementation of math physics. There is major progression from 2D grids to 3D graphs to 3D plus manifolds. The implication is systems level digital science in a diverse range of scientific disciplines with a potential fast path to disease resolution. AI is not just for text writing. Uh, when I, I see, see people in, you know, in public at events, I ask them if they're using it, what are they using it for? They're often using it for writing tasks they didn't wanna do themselves, an office memo, the wedding speech, um, but conversational AI assistants are learning tutors, chat companions, uh, research assistants, they have numerous, numerous values that we're discovering. The, uh, we're in a moment of in the increasing formalization of the computational infrastructure. This is a juggernaut of AI, math, physics, chemistry, biology. And this is changing our relationship to knowledge. We have the ability to mobilize entire knowledge graphs. I like what Manolis Kellis said, which is basically look at uh, your basic squirrel spends 85% of their time foraging for food. Humans, we spend 2% of our global GDP on agriculture. Uh, but Chad GPT is pure neocortex, no, uh, no, <laughs> no time limits constraining its activity. That's, uh, the AI area is certainly not without risks. And the, big, the biggest risk is that this is big corporate endeavor. The data farms that I mentioned that, ha that process the graph, trans the pre-trained transformers, the GPTs, uh, implies very large corporate titans. And who we see here is Google, Microsoft, Amazon, who is invested in Anthropic, which is Claude.ai and Meta. And so we are, maybe we are in a corporate overlord uh, kind of, uh, Orwellian situation with little control over our, our own data. So there are some open source LLMs um, and so we would expect to see uh, more of those. AI alignment is the how we can make AI that is supports human values and well-being for mankind. The three main approaches are uh, having a scientific method of hypothesis-driven, measurable, localized testing in, in LLMs and AI tools, stipulating that all projects must have a beneficial impact on humanity, uh, and having an internally, reward, internally learned reward function with perhaps with memory. So us humans learn internally our reward functions. And by analogy, hippocampal amnesia patients have the tendency to confabulate, uh, much like AI. These patients have logic, but not memory. And so it's possible that memory could help AIs not hallucinate and implement human values. Um, the ethics and moral status of digital minds is an ongoing philosophical topic engaged by Nick Bostrom at o the Oxford Future of Humanity Institute. And this growing uh, Joshua Bach is another scholar here too. This idea of how we develop uh, digital minds when we don't really understand what they are or could be, uh, but we, we, um, we develop them well. So there could be different phases of AI alignment, a near term, medium term and longer term, initially implementing registries. So we have sort of like a gap, general, ex generally accepted accounting principles. We have generally accepted AI principles. 
in the medium term, um, an, an episodic memory dossier and a, an internally learned cause and effect rewards function. And then longer term, um, we do what, what will it be like if we have generalist intelligences operating in the world with us? AI super alignment is the idea of, of uh, when a super intelligence wakes up in a data center, how do we implement I love humanity algorithms? So the AI infrastructure supports humans. That's very much an open and philosophical topic. Future scenarios could unfold different ways. There's a lot of uncertainty as to whether we'll have an AI enlightenment, uh, what a lot of job outsourcing might look like, what power and wealth redistribution might happen. And it's, it's quite unclear how things will develop. But uh, AI first digital science is progressing well with um, unleashing various data and analysis tools as we are firmly in a knowledge society with new platforms for accessing knowledge. They, uh, there's a big merge on maybe with human AI entities as partners. They, uh, we aren't losing jobs to AI, but losing jobs to humans who are able to operate AI better than we are. So there is very much a, how can I upgrade my own skill set in the new environment kind of attitude. There's also a big offload that not only cognitive, not only physical labor, but cognitive labor we are outsourcing to the new tools. And moving into science as information science for planetary problem solving. And the uh, more approximately research co-pilot tools for solving biology and new kinds of theorizing that we might be able to undertake in biology. Future of materials, I think this is my last slide, that um, really opening up our mindset for all kinds of new approaches in growing, not building materials and having mech GPT, this is a language-based strategy for uh, materials development uh, maybe plasmonics are a more efficient way of controlling EM spectrum with near field op optics. Um, so every, everything is on the table. Uh, thank you very much. I welcome your questions. I, I did not get any questions in the chat. So if you have something to uh, ask, please just unmute yourself and ask Melanie. Hi there. Uh, thank you for the talk. Sorry for arriving late, but even the parts that I was able to catch were profound, uh, inspiring, and also somewhat unsettling. Um, it seemed like the thesis of this presentation is that artificial intelligence is inevitably uh, going to begin replacing uh human thought in general, at least when it comes to engineering. Uh, and uh, does this usher in the end of human civilization as we know it? I'm not saying that we'll all be dead or that, you know, uh, the Skynet's going to kill us all, but is it really our civilization if artificial intelligence is solving all of our problems for us? Yeah, I think the main, uh, the main thing and what... <laughs> most people that try to work with AI on a daily basis uh, find is these are aids, AI is aids for experimental researchers in the day-to-day -day. and um, it's not replacing human thought, it's uh, facilitating human thought, um, performing things like information retrieval and a lower level analysis, uh, but in terms of ideation, um, we're, it's pressing us to figure out to offload a lot of the former uh, drudgery that we had to do as humans and to really open up our capabilities to do more of what we do uniquely well, which is ideation and putting new kinds of areas together. Um, so it, it's, um, I think the, the main tone would be uh, one of certainly caution, but also positive, um, positive, exploration and how these tools can help um, 
uh, engineering would be a perfect example. There are many kinds of things that would be great to offload to AI that tr traditionally we offloaded to other humans in our uh, work organizations. And that now uh, we're just able to, um, the constant question is how can I work more efficiently and achieve my goals more expediently? Um, I don't think um, there is a challenge of imagination, not, uh, not something more nefarious. On the other hand, it's also important to have scholars examining these more, these philosophical uh, existential kinds of questions. And I am not equipped to discuss that in more depth because that's not my field, but I do uh, follow work of scholars, namely Nick Bostrom had some recent comments on this lately and Joshua Bach is another scholar I follow um, who are thinking uh, more specifically about, well, how can we, how will we be proceeding right. forward as a human civilization? I'm here to see something on vector embedding. Anybody else with questions? There's something here on vector embedding. On the topic of vector embedding, would the abilities of quantum computing allow the creation of digital constructs that aren't bound by our current restriction based on our own understanding of spatial limitations? Yes, indeed. The um, vector embeddings, um, so David Silver at DeepMind um, points to the many hundreds of dimensional space analysis that vector embedding um, reinforcement learning systems conduct their efforts with. So the vector embeddings are fed into um, even, so even without quantum computing, um, not humans don't know all of how AI is doing its higher dimensional space analysis. And we just measure the accuracy of the outputs. Um, so it's, it is quite interesting, the idea of using neural networks as a physics investigatory tool, um, the explosion into hyperbolic space, which used to be only a theoretical model with black holes, uh, but now it's actually an implemented model in deep learning systems for more efficient learning. It's meant that um, neural networks have become a physics a physics tool and, and a basic science investigatory tool for physics in space and time. And I think that is pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, so uh -huh. wonder if copyright or other legal restrictions on data use, such as company trade secrets, could significantly limit improvements to language models from where we are now, given that now people are finally know that the possibilities are really valuable as opposed to maybe before they didn't really notice that. Yeah, so people, uh, organizations will typically implement an internal, um, a, 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 an LL model for their internal operations. And so, and when you go to, to chat GPT or open AI or many of these models, they will it make you click a bunch of acknowledgements that you know uh, not to put private data there. And so, for example, you know, I'm not putting any uh, patient genomic data into public tools. Um, I need to analyze that locally. Um, and so similarly, so a um, big user of these AI image mid journey and Dolly uh, is advertising agencies who make images. And so the IP question is very important in that context. They are very um, controlling their IP is an important parameter. So uh, I guess it, the key point is, it's sort of like when we got networks. So you have your private network, you're on your private network at work, and then you're on a public network surfing the internet. And so similarly, you can use a public LLM for your basic, you know, what's a good restaurant in my neighborhood or analyze some, you know, tell me about the new quantum computing advances. But uh, when I'm internal to my organization, I will use a private LLM on um, private private data. And so this is why this is why Microsoft and um, has a big investment in OpenAI and with their teams and their Copilot 365 project integrated into integrating AI into 
um, Microsoft the Word and Excel, the Microsoft Teams suite of applications is exactly because we want to use these technologies on private data sets internal to our organizations. Now, it'll be interesting to see how there's like a little bit of a tension here, because if you restrict to the private data, then you don't have as much to train your internal network as you would if it was open. But of course, you don't want to make it open. You'd like everybody yeah. else, but not, you, not let them have yours. So mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Right, exactly. So you have, um, so then you have everybody looking at, um, right, so you need to have it, so it's pre-trained basically on English language generally, but then, you know, maybe we have certain word orders that follow discreetly in our, you know, in our nanomedicine data, database, which in, internal to our research foundation is minute compared to open databases on the web, but yet the same kinds of relational analysis can be performed on the private data set from having pre-trained on the public data set. Thank you. Definitely like the idea of being able to use different spatial situations that we can't even conceive of, but um, my, my thought kind of goes to like the idea of a digital archive on the expanse of what we might consider a city. Yeah, say more. Um, like, you know, if you, if you have a digital archive and, you know, based on old computing technology, it would be limited to the amount of space that you could create with the with the with the chip. But if you expand it into with your with talking about hyperbolic spaces, if you expand that to where you can, you know, infinitely compress data and using AI to be able to structure that and be able to manipulate it in ways that we can't even think of because we don't have the processing power in our own minds to use, then, you know, the AI could create these vast networks of interconnected structures that would, if we could picture it, would resemble like a, a massive metropolis or city of information. Oh, I see. Yeah, the computronium, basically. Yeah, so like, um, you know, under these scenarios, there's some scenario that, you know, the, the AI take off and it takes takes off and leaves us. Maybe, maybe, and and you know, progresses into a dark matter computronium and uh, in hyperbolic space and whatever. Um, but um, I mean, the hope is that that. Uh, the hope is that we have AGI that sort of is our partner and helps us that, that together we discover more um, operating together. Uh, but yes, yeah, certainly we are, our human limits of 3D space and 1D time are quite apparent. We have Kantian goggles that we put on our perceptual apparatus developed at birth and um, that's why it's hard for us to think about the, why, why superposition and entanglement in the quantum realm are strange to us. That's why time dilation seems strange. But, um, but we know these other spatial temporal regimes to be part of physical reality. And then the, we, these AI tools are helping us exploit that now. So um, I'm just reading chat here. M theory equations. I'm sure you can ask AI for M theory solutions, and it will uh, M theory like a unified theory of the four forces. And uh, um, but everything in AI is a rehash of everything humans have already said. There's there's nothing new there. It's just a, fi a faster information retrieval or. Um, you can ask it to sort of generatively, you can ask it to apply Stephen Hawking's theory to some other domain. I try to do that actually a little bit to try to do more idea synthesis. Um, it's not, the tools are not really well equipped to do that. But in terms of solving M theory equations, I would definitely task AI math agents with 
blending, so evaluating math ecologies and getting the math together so we don't have to human do it. There's another question here about if we were to make humanoid machines and use AI as their brain, would we be able to place limits on what they could do? Would we be able to tell them to stop a task with them simply refusing? Yes, we have, we have no idea. So this would be go slow. Um, go slow under the scientific method. Don't, don't just give an AI a brain and see what it'll do, but go very, very slow. Um, do I have any thoughts on this F research F Switzerland article? A crystal in a quantum superposition state and measured for how long quantum effects lasted. I think I heard about this lately. Uh, putting bounds on modifications of quantum theory. Oh, yeah, I think so in quantum computing, the biggest concern is there are only a couple of algorithms discovered. And is that it? Or and why didn't we human find any more yet? And maybe there are more limits on that realm than we we sort of thought and assume. Um, I don't have. Yeah, so I think we're, we're we don't know the quantum realm yet. And we are this this kind of research at, at F Switzerland helps us understand the um, the, the size and scope and constraints in that domain. And we have something on homomorphic I encryption. Think, I think I might have some questions that were sent to me instead of you. So um, I'll read those out. Um, Austin Tucker said, on the topic of vector embedding. Yes. We did that. We did that. Did that. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> oh, that's right. I remember you reading that out. Um, And this is, again, Austin, I think you probably got all yours answered. I think we answered everything in the general chat except for homomorphic encryption could allow sharing data to train language models without revealing detail beyond the trained weights. Yeah, I think that'll be a new, a new thing we get into is um, more sophisticated data encryption and our use of LLMs. I have a question. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I put up the the um, the comment on that really cool sapphire slab, which is probably the biggest thing so far created that is operating in terms of quantum dynamics. Uh, but I've got another question unrelated to that, and it involves language and linguistics. I'm working on a Salish language that almost went extinct. The last native speaker died in 2014. And we have lots of recorded texts and written texts and well-developed grammar. Could LLMs and AI possibly use large scale data and the grammars of languages to effectively resurrect extinct or near extinct languages? I love it. Yes, yes, of course as a um, historical preservation tool and um, um, include, I mean, I could see this as, uh, you know, human employment of the future, uh, human, humans redirect productive effort to things they care about. And uh, so as preserving, like doing ethno ethnographic research about the languages spoken years ago or recently newly dead languages or all kinds of things like this or studying things. I didn't know, you know, the ancient Inca look at using, I, li I li like your idea of using what we know about formal, formal grammars and languages to, as a tool to impute missing missing things about human languages that we didn't know. And then maybe we have a whole, all kinds of new language studies about, well, we had no idea. We can, we can now investigate overlap between all kinds of ancient languages and what kind of conceptual advance these societies actually did had. Maybe we can now back impute with formal language structure um, and, and do a variety of historical studies. I think that's really great use of these tools. Thank you. It reminds me of like seed banks, you know, the Icelandic seed bank. You know, how do we do historical record keeping and preservation of languages, of organisms in the extinction of languages, the extinction of species? Hmm. 
just a quick comment. I'm thinking that with modern technology, the Egyptian hieroglyphs may have been translated and deciphered long before yeah. Jean-Francois Champignon got to them. Oh my it's goodness, you can just put a picture. That's great. There's so many fun things to do. If we just put a picture of the Rosetta Stone in you know, upload to Dolly or whatever and ask for a translation. We didn't have to wait for the Napoleonic troops to bring it back, scholars to take an interest, the British Museum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I expect my hypothesis would be all kinds of knowledge was already derived and then lost in the sands of time. I'd like to really thank Melanie for a very interesting talk.